Hi, Archie here. Welcome to part two of my Living Fairfield Lives interview with Pastor Chris, a real Aussie larrikin. If you missed out on part one, I encourage you to go and watch it so you may not miss out on any of Pastor Chris's wisdom. Every person has a story to tell, and we hope that you are encouraged and edified in your faith through these messages, well, testimonies. So please enjoy part two of Chris's interview and feel free to leave a comment. Could you please share a few of your favorite scriptures and how do you apply these to, the, to your life? Oh, how long have I got? <laughs> no, I'll try and behave myself. Probably one of the ones that stood out really early on was, that came to me was, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that two things stood out about me. If you delight yourself in the Lord, that means you focus on him. He will give you desires. That means he will put desires in your heart that are good. Not, not just whatever you desire. Because, but then there's also this aspect that God's going to put something and you really want this and go, I gave you that desire, but you can't have it. No, that ain't going to happen. So if God puts a desire there and it's a good one and you're working, it will happen at the right time. So in a sense, one of the ways that really worked out for me was, you know, by the time I was 25, I started to realize mm, this being single is pretty ordinary. So I was looking for a wife. Now, it was 32 before I met my first wife. Um, but God did provide. And so, you know, I didn't know what sort of job I particularly wanted, but I wanted a job that honoured God and helped other people. And I was teaching for a while, and I've been in the ministry. And and I, I love my job as a pastor, and God's provided that. I did not want to be a city pastor. Country pastor, please. Well, let's go Blackwater, Kazakhstan, Silverdale, which is south of Ipswich in the country, and Mergen. Yep, yep, so far they're all country. Praise God. So that's the first one. Another verse that is um, very I, – I put that one first because it's chronologically, but probably my favourite verse in the Bible comes to Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together for the good of those who love Christ Jesus. Now, I have been known to have a piece of people that go, it's all good. No, it's not, you idiot. Not everything that happens is good. It all works for the good. And how has that worked out in my life? Oh, lots of ways. Um, but whenever something ordinary has happened, you go, well, okay, I'll trust you, God. Then that, that you know, I didn't. The job, some of the jobs I've had and that didn't work out as a teacher have prepared me for things later on. Um, losing my wife who died not long after we were married, my first wife, was just pretty hard stuff. But through that, I can't, there are so many times that I know I've been able to share with people walking through tough times that are different and you've got something to share and it's helped them. And yes, God has supplied my needs there, and I have married again, and I have a wonderful wife. Um, that it, all of the things, as I look back, even the, the hardest things in my life, I go, has God brought good out of it? Yes. So there's that one. Another verse that's really important is Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. Okay. Haven't quite managed that perfect thing yet, so... Every now and again, I do things and I go, oh, crap, that wasn't a good idea. And I didn't get that right. So, sorry, God. And it says there's no condemnation. So that, and growing up, there'd be times, you know, you come home and the house is empty. Oh, has the rapture happened? Have I been left behind? I don't know whether any other Christians have that one. Oh, there are others that have that one. Yes. Well, I go, hang on. There is no condemnation. Do I genuinely believe that I've trusted God? And yes, okay? Which brings me another. Romans 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart that Christ is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so what's the criteria for being a Christian? Believing that Jesus is who he said he is, believing that he died and believing that he rose again. Uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff to work out as to the working it out and doing it well. But that's the criteria for salvation. So coming back to that one regularly. The one I preached this morning. In every situation, in every situation, take your petitions to God, 
with thanksgiving and the peace of God that will guard your heart, that transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. No, there will be times of trouble in this world. But God says, I can get you through. He says, I'll give you a peace within when you hang on to him, when you're thankful. And so do I look at that and go, yeah, is that true? Yes. There are times when I don't know what the future holds, uh, but that peace has been there. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Okay. Um, no, I do not believe the prosperity gospel. that You just follow God and everything will be wonderful. No. But when you choose God and put him first, there will be a lot of good things. Um, there will still be some tough bits to the road, but it's not going to be all tough roads all the time. Now, that actually leads to another one. Another one of my favorite verses, which is a weird one for some ways, is Jesus saying, my God, my God, is there any other way to do this? Can you take this cup away from me, but not my will but thine? And I go, I'm glad Jesus prayed that. Anyone who looks at the cross with Romans and goes, yep, I want to do that, that's not someone I want to follow. Someone who goes, that's a really raw deal and I'd rather not do it, but not my will but yours will do that. Which come, touches on putting these two, that and the last verse together. Okay, Jesus took the hard road. But even his life on earth, which wasn't ideal, there were a lot of moments of joy and good bits. There was a, a, a three, four day period where it was pretty damn ordinary being flogged and taken on a cross. That was in the grave. That was pretty bad. But there was also the resurrection and those time after. And the 2000 years since we're in heaven, you know, there's times I'm sure he looks down and looks at some of us and goes, didn't I teach you better than that? But there's times I'm sure he goes, hey, Gabriel, look at my boy there. Look what he did. That is so cool. So that, that, that God that we follow, and there's a whole lot of good in it, and it will end in good in um, eternity. And the, But there will be the tough things there, but he says, I'll get you through them. Um, oh, another favorite verse. <sighs> if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask. And the God who gives generously will give to all. Uh, yes. Do I lack wisdom? Yes. I don't know all I need to know. But as I look back, sure, there's been some decisions I've made that aren't great, but I look back and go, I do not have any regrets of anything I've done because of, by God's grace, he's got me through it. And, and yeah, the, even the ordinary bits, most of those were not, were things that were going to, there was no way around them. Um, I'm not that good that I've never made some dumb decisions, but a lot of decisions because there's been that genuinely that prayer for wisdom he's got you through. So is that enough verses or do you want some more? What is one piece of advice you can you would give to new believers? Oh, I can't hold it down to one. <laughs> Got to go for three. <laughs> Number one, this is the best quote I got from any of my lecturers at college. If you pray with the real honesty in your heart, God, I want to do it your way. Stop worrying because God will get you there. You won't know the whole track and the whole thing. He doesn't give you an outline or map, but here it is. He says, but he will get you there. So to know that the thing you need to go is regularly go, God, I seriously, I'm, I'm honest with myself and you. I want to do it your way. So that's the first piece of advice I'd give. The second piece of advice is, Find godly Christians who are further down the track than you that you trust and like and have conversations with them to learn off them. Find yourself some godly mentors. Have a go. All things work together for the good of those. Use the best information you've got at the time and make a decision and go for it. I preached on wisdom recently and I defined wisdom as using the knowledge you have now to make the best decision you can now that is best for you and others around you for now and in the future. Um, take those things into account. What would God want? What's good for those around me and what's good for me? And it's not just good for now, but it's good for the future as well. Think about those things, pray about those things and make a decision and go for it. What changes have you seen in the church in Australia, good, bad, good or bad during your time as a pastor? The church to a certain extent reflects society. That's because the church is people. It's full of people and they live in the society they are in. Now, 
in my time as a pastor, it's probably hasn't, it's just been a continual in this direction. But when I talk to my father, who was a pastor for 25 years before I was, so he's been pastoring 50 years, we live in a society now where authority is under attack from every side that you don't listen to authority. So when my father started as a young pastor, you'd come and what you said, people's first starting point was, well, we assume he's speaking from God and it's probably good. And unless there's a reason to disagree with it, uh, we do it. Now you live in a society when you say anything, the people are, a lot of society is like, prove it, convince us. Um, now I would be say that that's not the reality in a lot of people in my church in the sense that because I've been there a while, I come in as a, not a junior pastor and I've built credibility over time there. When I say something, they mostly assume, oh yeah, it's probably, but so that's one of the things. The other aspects of people are busier nowadays that they're at full stretch. Most of the people in my church are fully stretched out doing what they do. There's not a lot of spare time in them for doing anything. And the, th- the other thing is the bureaucracy and compliance load our society puts on any organisation makes it very difficult to do anything. When I was, even when I was at uni, at Bible college and helping out with a youth group, the things and games you could play in a lot were fun and a lot easier. Now, half of the games I would have played as a youth, done as a youth group kid, you just can't even think about doing them now. So, and if you go to do anything, if you want to start a youth group now, you would need probably at least six committed leaders before you could even start. To You would need someone who's got a high compliance appetite that can fill out dray loads of paperwork, all this sort of stuff. Um, to do anything requires a huge amount of bureaucracy, which makes startup very difficult. So that level of compliance within a church um, has grown over time. Um, on the plus side, where one of the things I do see is that we're better at working with other churches. You know, we recognise that even though they're Catholics, Lutherans, or whatever, they're Christians too. Um, I would say there's le- there's actually less judgmentalism in a church that people are more accepting. I would couch that in that our society sees judgmentalism where it isn't now. So it doesn't feel like that. People will come in and say, the church is judging me. Uh, actually, no, they're just disagreeing with you. A disagreement isn't judgment. I don't like your hat. Not I do, actually. But you can go, fine, I do. It's none of your darn business. And it's not being judgmental if I said I don't like your hat. It doesn't matter. Um, but people will, so, sometimes our society takes it as, you're being judging of me because you don't like your hat. No, I just don't, don't happen to like those hats. That's, you know, so there's that. So ministry has got harder over time, I do believe. I, I, if I talk to my father who's been a minister, for, started ministering 60 years ago, he would say the same. But we have a big God who's on the throne. And that's probably one of the, the biggest things, I think. Years ago, there, there were a lot of people went to church. And our society was quite, had Christian standards. And that was the thing. Now, now we don't. We don't hold the Christian standards. 30 years and more ago, it was better for society. The more society holds Christian standards, the better society runs. But I don't think it was necessarily as good for the kingdom of God because you had people who would say they are Christians and not, and so they didn't act like Christians. So people in the church and others would be hurt by what they did and they're going, well, if that's what Christ is, I don't want it. And Christ saying, yeah, if that's what I was, I wouldn't want it either because they are saying they're Christian, not acting it. So the kingdom of God was hurt by the actions of people who were Christian in name only. Now we live in an era where people still go, oh, that's what they think it is. But most of the people in our churches now are not there because that's what you do. They're there because it's real. And so, and and because our society has drifted, gone away from and is going further away from Christian values, 
it's going downhill. There's strange stuff happening. I believe that will come to a point where people go, okay, that's not working. We're going to have, we're looking for something else and the real Christians will stand out. I believe, and there's going to be pain involved, but our society is, the further it gets from God, the bigger mess it's going to make. The bigger the mess is, some people will start to go, ah, there must be a different way. Well, thank you for answering all the questions, Chris. Very, um, very informative. Thank you for inviting me. Like I say, give me a microphone to talk about God, I'll do it. We'd like to give you this CD, uh, Robin Mount Ultimate Collection. I like Robin Mark stuff. He's good. Thank you. Mm. These other days. I'll, I won't sing because I like you. We hope you have enjoyed watching this episode of Living Faithful's Wives and have um, been encouraged. Thank you all for watching. It's been a blast. Pull the trigger. Pull the trigger. Ha-ha! Thank you. God be with you and goodbye. God bless. Amen.